Well, hello and welcome to the first of our four webinars in our Whitefish Point Bird Observatory series, celebrating spring migration at Whitefish Point. We're so happy to have you joining us today. Um, today's topic is the owls of Whitefish Point, but before we get to that, I'd like to review a few logistics to make sure that we have a fun and successful webinar together. So there are two ways you may be joining us today, um, either through Zoom or through Facebook. Throughout the entire presentation, please feel free to share your questions with us, which we'll answer once we've finished. Um, to submit your questions through Zoom, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Questions through Facebook can be added to the comments section, and I'll be monitoring those throughout and keeping track of them. But again, we'll wait until the end to answer them. This presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing once it's completed. So the video will be available immediately on our Facebook page when we're finished, and we will get it uploaded to our YouTube channel by sometime next week. If you're watching a recording of the presentation or if you have questions at a later time, you can always send those to us um, to Michigan Audubon's general email address at birds at michiganaudubon.org. So as I mentioned, this webinar is part of a series of webinars that highlight the different ongoing research and monitoring efforts at Whitefish Point Bird Observatory. Um, and it celebrates the magic of spring migration, which we're all really happy to have happening right now. Whitefish Point Bird Observatory itself is located 11 miles north of Paradise, Michigan in the Upper Peninsula, up here at the tip. Um, and Whitefish Point Bird Observatory is a program of Michigan Audubon um, with the specific mission to document the distribution and abundance of birds in the Great Lakes region with special emphasis on migration and habitat. Whitefish Point Bird Observatory, also known as WPBO, has been monitoring and documenting the migration of tens of thousands of birds that funnel to the point every spring and fall for over four years. So you can learn more about this history of WPBO. You can read the current field staff blogs and watch live count data via Dunkadoo on our website at wpbo.org. So we're happy to be starting this four-part webinar series with the owls of Whitefish Point, Unfortunately, due to their banding schedule, our spring banders, Chris Neary and Nova McKentley, are unable to join us for the webinar. But lucky for us, they were able to pre-record their program so that we could hear from, about the owls from the people who know them best. So without further ado, um, I'm happy to share with you all the program that they were able to record for us. Hi, welcome to the Owls of Whitefish Point. I am Nova McKentley. Uh, this is my 17th year banding owls here at Whitefish Point. Um, Chris Neary, this is my 20th year of owl banding at the point. So Whitefish Point has been conducting owl research here for over 30 years. Uh, this long-term targeted research has established Whitefish Point as home to one of the largest and most diverse annual owl migrations in North America. So why is Whitefish Point such a good migratory spot? So right now, birds are moving north from their wintering grounds to their breeding grounds. Many species of land birds do not want to cross large bodies of water. So as birds are moving south right now, whether it's through Wisconsin or the Lower Peninsula, um, as they hit the southern shore of Lake Superior, they're going to follow the shoreline until they find a place where they can see land or not have to make a water crossing at all. Um, so right now, the birds are hitting the southern shore of Lake Superior, and a lot of them are funneling to Whitefish Point as they try to find their way. Whitefish Point's not a particularly diverse breeding grounds, but during migration, both in spring and fall, due to the geography, um, it can be pretty spectacular. While it's not great breeding grounds here, a lot of the region is great boreal forest, which provides nesting habitat for a lot of birds, including owls. We've had 10 species of owls that have occurred here at Whitefish Point. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with owls at all, uh, Northern Sawet Owl, this is our most common. This is a boreal owl, long-eared owl, 
This is a shore-eared owl. We don't see too many of them. Mostly, you'll see them during the day, during the water bird count. Barred owl. Of course, great gray owl. Northern hawk owl. Great horned owl. Snowy owl. And last but not least, barn owl. Before we talk about the research that's done here, we'll talk a little bit about owls. As nocturnal predators, they obviously have to have some special adaptations um, to form that, that rule. Their eye is obviously the, the key factor here. When you look at this owl's face, the eyes are really what draw you in. They also have, well, this owl has ear tufts sticking up, but those are actually not in relation to its ears at all. So this is a boreal owl. Owls have asymmetric ear openings, and in North America, boreals have the most asymmetric. The ear is actually located kind of behind the eye on the side of the head, and their facial disc has a skin flap that actually opens up, and there in there you can see the bluish thing is actually the back of the eye and then the ear opening. To the right, there's two photos of a boreal skull. In the top image, the beak is it's looking at you, and you can see this ear, the right ear in the image, is lower than the one on the left. It's also pushed forward compared to the one on the left. This effectively gives the owl 3D hearing. So if there's a mouse or whatever prey under leaf litter or under snow, when it hears some rustling, it'll start bobbing its head, tilting it from side to side until the sound is reaching both of the ear openings at the same time. And with, even without seeing it, it has pinpointed its prey. Owl's eyes. They say if our eyes were as large as an owl's relative to the size of our skulls, we would have eyes the size of softballs or grapefruits. <laughs> owls also have more rod cells in their eyes, which are light receptors, which gives them the nocturnal vision. They have less cone cells than we do, which are the color receptors. Um, so they don't see as much color as we do. Now, this photo in the bottom shows a saw wet owl, we call it, was obviously blind in that right eye. Owls can survive in the wild, wild with compromised eyesight, probably better than other species because of that specialized hearing that will allow them to still successfully hunt even with compromised eyesight. That owl in the bottom was actually recaught at another station about three months after we banded it and it had put on weight. So it was migrating and hunting successfully. The feet, as a bird of prey, you need some weapons to kill your prey. This is a great horned owl's foot. Um, these guys can take large prey. Most of the ones that we've banded here have smelled like skunk. Um, we had one with porcupine quills. Uh, so these guys are, of the North American owls, these guys and snowies can take the largest prey. Um, and the next slide is a snowy owl's foot, which they're very closely related, essentially the same foot, but snowies need to be able to survive much colder conditions, breeding up in the Arctic, often wintering in the Arctic. So in the next slide, you can see how much more feathered the foot of a snowy owl is to help them insulate the feet and survive those cold conditions. Likewise, a boreal owl. Um, so you can see how feathered these feet are. These guys come to the UP to escape winter, and they don't even always come this far south to escape winter. So again, just incredibly feathered, insulated feet. Long legs, raptors, all raptors have, you know, have long legs. They're varying length, but much longer than you would normally see on a perch bird or a bird in flight. Helps them get to their prey. If they're taking larger prey, probably helps them protect getting their body bit by something fighting back. They have large blocky wings as well. Well, they don't all have blocky wings, but this great gray owl does. Um, and the amazing thing is that if you've ever found an owl feather in the woods, you'll know that the feathers are really, really soft. They're much softer than any other species. And if, if you look at the outer edge of especially the primary um, 10 and 9, you'll see this serration. Um, this allows the air to pass through, and it's really noticeable on those particular feathers. And this is just something that owls have. 
it's really unique to them. Between that and the softness, they're just completely silent when they fly. If one flies by you, you wouldn't even notice it. So that serration breaks up the airflow as the bird's in flight, helping to give them the silent flight. This is a sawwet owl that we caught in the net and it still had its prey somehow. That is, it's only happened twice while we've been here. And so it's very unusual. The, we measured the, well, we, sorry, we weighed the vole and then weighed the sawwet and the vole was actually half the weight of the sawwet. So how many species go out there every night and catch something that is half their weight to eat? It's pretty amazing. And so then you might take the next step and think, well, how does it eat something that big? So when you look at an owl, you don't really notice its mouth. It seems like it has a very small mouth. I mean, you see the bill, but actually it's a lot bigger than you might think. <laughs> this is a great gray owl chick and it is actually completely capable of swallowing a bowl whole. All right, so we conduct the owl banding here at Whitefish Point Bird Observatory in spring, summer, and fall. And we are the only place that has three full seasons of owl banding in the whole US. So it's fairly special. Oh, and this picture, this is a great gray owl with the moon behind it um, that we saw one year out at the point. So this is an aerial map of Whitefish Point. Um, on the left, you can see most of the buildings are, those are all the shipwreck museum. And then on the right side of the parking lot, there's a little tiny building, which is the owl banding lab and the owl's roost. And then the red circle is generally the area where we have all of our nets for the banding out in the woods. When we begin the banding in March, it's usually pretty wintry still. This is a view of Lake Superior, ice covered with some snow. And then this is how things start out normally. We are on snowshoes and skis, and it's still pretty much complete winter. However, we do get some treats. We get to see the northern lights from time to time. And then we hope that we see this when we go out to the net lanes. Lots of eyes, owl eyes. So mist nets are used to capture our owls. Um, we have these nets, so you'll see on the left, um, it kind of looks like a volleyball net, but with three tiers and it has these pockets. And so the owl is flying along and doesn't see the net and it gets caught in the pocket, kind of falls down in and we go out and check our nets every 45 minutes and take the owl out of the net and bring it back to the banding lab. And th these are the huts where we keep the smaller owls if they need to await their banding process. This was a night that we actually had filled all of the huts. So it was a, a pretty busy night. This is the banding process. So we take the owl out of the hotel. And the first thing we do is put this metal band on its leg. The bands are all issued by US Fish and Wildlife or USGS. <laughs> bands are all issued by USGS. Uh, they issue bands to everyone in North America, everyone in the US and Canada. Um, and so that way there's a specific database. Everyone needs to report all of their bands and what they were put on uh, and all the information to the bird banding lab. So that way, if someone else captures your bird, you can get that information. So the band is put on their leg and then we put them in a can to weigh them. The can keeps them calm and they're not just going to sit on the scale for us, unfortunately. So that's one way to weigh them. Then we do wing measurements. This is measuring the wing cord of a great horned owl here. We look at the amount of fat in the furcular hollow, which is right in here. And then the state of the keel, how much muscle is on the keel. And this particular owl actually has a brood patch as well. Uh, we, we catch a large number of sawets that have brood patches in the spring. We've caught over 200, uh, I think, in a spring that have had active brood patches. And this just seems to be something that they develop um, 
prior to breeding. Some owls also have what we call a molt pattern, um, especially sawets uh, and some longyards retain some of their feathers and do not drop all of their flight feathers in one year. So what you end up with is some feathers that look more light brown and other feathers that are more dark brown. The darker brown are the newer feathers, the lighter brown are the old feathers. This happens in a pattern, and so we are able to age the owl depending on the pattern. And when we're done with all that, we just release the owl, and it goes on and migrates. The three most commonly banded owl species up here are sawets, boreals and longeards, which you probably know if you've visited, although boreals are becoming a lot less common. And then the smallest and largest, this is a little sawet owl and then a great gray owl on the right. And you can see great gray owls are just terrified of sawet owls. <laughs> so although the banding here has been going on for over 30 years, we added the summer project in 2006 and made some significant changes to the spring um, in 2007. So we really think of the current, the modern practice of the owl banding here, the way we do it, um, to have started really in 2006. So just since 2006, we have banded 14,664 sawets, 368 boreals, 2,283 longyards, 234 bards, 13 great grays, 13 great horns, two northern hawk owls, two short eards, and one snowy. All right, here's a graph to sort of represent what we've banded um, and it's broken up by season. So a total of 22,201 owls have been banded here since 1993. And the blue is spring, the red is summer, and the green is fall. You can see by numbers, fall is kind of the, the least amount, which is unusual for a site. Most migration, especially with owl species, people think of happening during the fall, but actually our spring season here tends to be much more productive than the fall. First, we'll talk a little bit about sawets. They are definitely the most common owl banded in the United States and probably the cutest. They, when you find them roosting, they're, they're just kind of hanging out I don't know what else to say. <laughs> and what's amazing is how infrequently they are found roosting during the day. There was a spring where we banded over 700 and not a single one was documented outside the banding. Um, so it's amazing how good these birds are at hiding. Um, and without the targeted effort that WPBO has made for decades, uh, they would really just go undetected on the migration here, despite the fact that they're pretty common. Yeah, this is, um, this is a good time to answer the question that some people will ask, which is uh, you can count hawks and you can count water birds, but why are you banding owls? Why aren't you just counting them? And that is specifically because owls fly at night and so it would be impossible to count them. Um, and we would miss almost all of the owls that come through. So banding is a really good way to actually assess what uh, what the population is um, that's actually making its way past Whitefish Point. So this was a night that we caught three owls just as it started to rain. And so we brought them back to the lab and we, we actually just let them fly around in there for a few minutes to get dried off. Um, it's only a 10 by 10 space, so it's, it's not too hard to recapture them. Uh, these two seem to be having a conversation. And then, of course, there's this guy in the corner. Who knows what he's up to? Something crazy. And most nights, we can get the birds processed real quickly, get them out under cover of night. This was the biggest night we've ever had here where we caught 122 owls. Um, so we could not get them all processed and released while it was still dark. We don't want to release the owls during the day because we have hawk flights here. Um, we'll get harassed by bird, even you know songbirds, um, maybe photographers. So we have a large holding cage back at the staff house. 
that every once in a while we'll take the birds back if we can't get them out in time, um, let them roost peacefully during the day, and then in the evening just open the door and let them fly out. So it was just amazing to see all these solowets roosting in there. Yeah, and solowets are just one of the few species that can communally roost. Not all owl species would be like that, of course. Um, but watching them fly out when we opened the door at dusk was amazing. It was like watching a Harry Potter movie. <laughs> All right, so here's a graph of just sawets banded in the spring um, through this year, or through last year. And you can see in 2007, some changes were made. Prior to 2007, everything was passive. There was no audio lure or caller that was used here. Um, in 2007, we started using this collar. It's the toot sound of the sawwet, and our captures went up significantly. So uh, we've been using it ever since. And you can see sawwets have a typical four to five year cycle where they gradually go up and peak, and then the, it will drop down. Um, we should be at peak this year as well, and that seems to be bearing out. So, of course, one of the main reasons to ban owls is so that you can recapture owls. So this is a map of all of our encounters through 2017. So we sometimes capture owls from other stations elsewhere, um, and then we also recapture some of our own owls. So this shows 199 of our own owls coming back, and then 683 encounters from other stations as well. The, the little numbers that are in the circle just show those different stations, how many were captured from those different stations. So you can see the owls move around a lot further than we may have anticipated. We kind of assumed the Great Lakes area, that's, that's kind of normal. The, the owls are moving in this area. But then when we started getting all these other hits as well, we were pretty amazed. So you can't, I don't know if you can see it up on the far right, but as far as Eastern Quebec, and then as far south as Alabama, and then as far west as Saskatchewan. So we've had the Saskatchewan one, there's three of them, and those were all sawwets. And it's hard to imagine these little owls just going that far, 1133 miles from the prairie all the way down to us. And oh, the other thing is that most of these encounters are sawwets. There's a few barred owls in here um, and then a couple of long eards, but it's for the bulk sawwets. Boreal owls. These guys are one of the, the species that makes Whitefish Point pretty unique in the lower 48. They're one of the most sought after birds in North America. They're really a Northern species that is pretty much uncommon anywhere in the Eastern 48. Um, this is their range map. You can see they just barely make it down into Minnesota for breeding. In the west, they do occur at high elevations. That's because the habitat in the high western mountains um, is very similar to what it is in the north. Also, the climate, the cool temperatures, and the similar habitat. Since 1978, 1,606 boreals have been banded at WPBO. Outside the banding effort here, they're very rarely documented in Michigan. Um, obviously, every few years, there might be one found in the winter. But without the targeted effort that WPBO has been conducting for decades, their occurrence within the state would be virtually unknown. Uh, just a shot for comparison of a sawwet on the left there and a boil on the right. It can be pretty apparent when you have them in hand. Um, this is actually a bigger size difference than we see a lot of the time. But when they're roosting in a pine tree, um, obscured, it can be kind of hard to tell the difference at times. Okay, so this graph shows bo the boreal owls that we banded since spring of 1995. You saw the difference, the changes we made in 2007, the impact of the changes we made on the saw wet captures. We really had hoped that we would see the same effect on the boreal owls, but we haven't. Um, and actually, prior to the year shown in this graph, back in the late 80s, early 90s, passively, you could band over 100 boreals in a spring season, and I think it was up to 170. So since the early 90s, the peaks would, would get up to around 70, you know, not in the 70s. Um, 
once we introduced the audio lure, we really hoped to see a jump, but it stayed in the 70s. And actually the last eruption, it went down to 20, which is far less than any of the eruptions when it was passive. So their numbers here have been declining. We don't know why, if climate change is causing them to come, you know, not as far south, logging practices um, affecting breeding. We really just don't know. All we can say is that their numbers here at Whitefish Point have declined. And it's unfortunate because there are just so few other stations that capture boreal owls that we can't very easily call them up and say, you know, hey, are you catching fewer boreal owls? Is there a problem with the population? We just don't know. Long-eared owls, they are the star of the show this year for sure. And they're just one of the reasons that a lot of people love to come up to the point. Here's a long-eared owl roosting. And a lot of photos you see of long eared they're in their concealment posture. They've been woken up, they're scared. Yeah. They don't wanna flush. These guys will get harassed by crows, ravens, and even killed by some hawks. We don't know why they seem at such a disadvantage during the day. They're real similar to harriers, which can fly around safely. Um, but long eareds definitely do not want to get flushed during the day. And this one, this shows one that's relaxed. Its eyes are still closed. It's not stretched thin. Um, so just to give you an idea, what one looks like when it's feeling undisturbed. If it goes into concealment, you are alarming it. Yeah, that's, and it happens to the best of us. You're walking around Whitefish Point, and if you happen to see a long-eared owl, and it's it's kind of like this, it's you know very, very thin, it's got its tufts up, and it looks alarmed, the best thing to do is to just back way off, and it will gradually calm down, and that way you won't flush the bird. It won't leave its perch and potentially get harassed by crows or hawks or whatever else. So this is long-eared spring captures up until last year. And uh, we made some changes in the banding uh, around 2015. Prior to that, you can see, actually, wasn't it your first year? Yeah, my first spring was in 1999. And I and my banding partner, he was Niels Monomy. We didn't even know it. But the 176 we banded that spring was a North American record for the number of long years banded in, in a spring or in a, any season. Um, so since then, since we made those changes in 15, you know, the second year we banded 336, which was a new North American record, then 2017, 423, breaking the record again. So Whitefish Point right now holds the four top seasons of long years. Um, and we're looking like we're going to break, well. Well, we don't know. Yeah, maybe not break the record, but we're up there again, you know, get approaching 300 this spring already. So the timing of them, lots of people want to know when's the best time. And typically, they are peaking in late April to early May. Um, this can really vary when you have an early spring, late spring. But, you know, the long-term data, this is in general the best time to see them. And actually, just last week, we had a night of 59 long years, which is the record here and probably the North American record for the number banded in a night. And actually, the next night, I think 22 were seen up on the hawk platform coming out of the woods and getting ready to fly over the lake. So that was really a treat for people. And this is, of course, always what you want to see when you're up on the hawk platform watching for long-eared owls. Just before the sun is setting, they hopefully come out of the woods and they start making their way down the shore. And just so people don't expect to see this, most of the time they're coming up at, you know, when it's getting dark and you're just seeing a silhouette. Um, but it's still amazing to see, you know, a dozen, 30 long years just get up and start their flight. So male and female long eards, the way you tell them apart is actually coloration. And the males are very light colored underneath the wing. And a lot of the times also on the facial disc, on the body and on the feet. Females tend to be very buffy colored everywhere. So you can really see that there's a big difference. However, there is a big unknown range in the middle. So a couple of years ago, um, a paper was put out by Denver Holt 
um, from the Owl Research Institute. He has been studying a breeding population of longeards in Montana for decades. And in trying to determine how to sex them, because he was working with nesting birds and he knew male and female, he started using one cell soil charts um, to compare or to document the coloration of the different sexes. So he published his paper a few years ago, and we were talking to Alec Lindsay, who's a professor at Northern Michigan University, um, and he said, you know, I'm a geneticist. Uh, if you wanted to start collecting samples, we can run DNA analysis on these. Um, so we started collecting samples in 2016, and we are excited that he now has a, a master's student, a graduate student, Emily Griffith, who is going over this and samples we collected last year as well. And she's doing a little, she's doing more than that in her study, but we're particularly excited about this aspect of it. Oh, here's a couple of photos that Alec took for us um, where you can see we really know what we're talking about. Very confident people oh, yeah. on the left, no <laughs> doubt about it. <laughs> oh. All right, back to the show. A little bit about barred owls. Um, we do catch some barred owls both in spring and in fall here. They're the only dark-eyed owl that we capture here at the point, and they're definitely one of the larger owls. They just have a really beautiful look to them. Barred owls are non-migratory through the majority of their range, but there are some northern sites that catch a small number um, that are, are moving from year to year. In spring, we typically will catch a few. You know, a handful of the most ever was 17 back in, looks like, 98. Um, so varying numbers, but uh, never significant numbers of them. However, in fall of 2007, they captured 60 barred owls. This was a direct result of the Sleeper Lake fire, which at the time was the largest fire ever in Michigan. And uh, it actually came as close as, I think it was 17 miles from Whitefish Point. And that was in the summer. And so there was just this big influx of barred owls after that. They have a big blocky wing and a blocky head as well. So if you're seeing an owl in flight um, and it's dark, uh, that that's one thing to look for for a barred owl. Great gray owls, another very sought after species in the lower 48. And why not? They're just amazing birds. The facial disc is just iconic um, in the North American owls. Like the boreal owl, we're seeing declining numbers of these guys as well as northern hawk owls. These guys were never that numerous, but we could expect to see them the majority of years. We caught a very small sample or percentage of the birds we saw, but caught as many as 14 back in the spring of 2015. 2005. 2005, thank you. Um, but they're just becoming increasingly scarce, and even in years where you expect eruptions, we're lucky if we ban them, um, even see them some years. So just the three northern forest owls, boreals, great grays, and northern hawk owls, numbers have just been declining here in recent years. This was a night when we actually happened to capture three great gray owls just about at sunrise. Um, so that was kind of a momentous occasion. It was way back when we first met, I think, in <laughs> 2005. <laughs> and although they're the largest owl in North America by body size, I mean, great horns and snowies are heavier and more powerful. Um, great grays are a lot of fluff, but they're huge. And this great gray was perched up against a jack pine right off the parking lot at the point. And it wasn't until like 11 o'clock that anyone noticed it because they just blend in incredibly up against tree bark. Um, that's a jack pine that it's blending in with there. They're another one, the Strix, they just have these huge heads. Um, people often say it's like a bowling ball that's been dished out a bit. You can see how huge it's headed. Another bird with a large rectangular wing, this particular one's molting some primary, so that effect is, is a little less on, on this individual. And this is stuff we point out because people like to look at the evening owl flights and ask how you can tell the difference. Um, you know, so compared to long years, even the size difference, I mean, these guys are just large-headed, big, blocky wings. 
So that's a little bit about the owls up here at Whitefish Point. We hope that in another year you can come up and visit us and get to experience the owl banding. And thank you very much. And there is an owl in this photo, if you can see it right in the middle. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, great. So um, even though Chris and Nova weren't able to be here with us today in person, um, I do want to thank them for taking the time to record that presentation for us because it really is great to be able to hear about those owls from the people who are really spending the most time with them. Um, I also want to just mention on behalf of Chris, um, after reviewing the recording, um, I'd like to make a slight correction on his behalf. Near the beginning of the presentation, he noted that the birds were currently flying south. However, at this point in the year, they're flying north. Um, he typically does this presentation in the fall, and so I think it was force of habit, but he wanted to make sure that everyone understood that he does know the difference and does actually know that the that the birds are flying, flying north during this time of year. So um, again, questions can be um, sent to us through the Q&A box on Zoom, through the comment section on Facebook. Um, I want to also note, um, because Nova kind of mentioned it at the end of their presentation, um, although we typically offer a public viewing of our owl banding program, the public viewings are unavailable at this time because of limitations due to COVID-19. So they are not open to the public right now. We're hopeful that maybe by next year, we'll have an opportunity to open them back up to the public but we'll continue to update our website with any of the changes that we make in regards to these viewings and other COVID protocols. So if you make it up to the point right now, unfortunately there isn't public viewing, but there is still owl viewing going on. Um, and Chris and Nova are publishing weekly blogs to let us know what they're catching and what's going on. So you can keep up with that as well. So um, in order to answer your question today, I'm really happy to have with us a longtime supporter and volunteer, Mike Bishop. Um, Mike, would you like to tell us, introduce yourself to us all so everybody knows where you're coming from? Yeah, so uh, some of you may know me. Um, I've been a Michigan Audubon board member for several years. Before that, I was on the Whitefish Point board for many, many years. I also, uh, when I did my master's, uh, I did an analysis of the owl banding uh, at that time, which would have been up through about 19, this is a while ago, <laughs> up through about 1998. Um, and uh, so I've been involved with uh, some of the protocols and when we made the switch to the um, audio luring in the spring and we made some changes to the audio luring program that had been running in the fall as well. I was, uh, I worked with the, the group uh, on that. So, um, so yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions as best as I can. Obviously, Chris and Nova are the experts. They know this stuff backwards and forwards, but uh, I can probably muddle through with uh, at least more basic questions. And if I, if I don't know, I will find out and get back to you with it. Perfect. Um, so I did wanna start off our questions with just a slight clarification. Um, so Mike, can you clarify for us how banding is permitted and who oversees the bands and the data and how that all works? Right, so um, all birds in uh, North America, which includes uh, Canada, the United States, and Mexico, are uh, protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which had its 200th birthday a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, that uh, prohibits individuals from handling birds of any kind without a permit of some sort. So if you're gonna hunt ducks or upland game birds, you get a hunting permit. If you wanna do any kind of research on songbirds or raptors or, or all the other non-game species, um, uh, you need to get some kind of a permit in order to do that. So banding, which obviously involves you know, physical contact with the birds, requires a permit through the United States Geological Service, uh, which houses the, uh, the banding lab for uh, the um, United States. Canada has its own version, as does Mexico. And um, they issue the bands for all the banders in North America. And they also warehouse all of the data. So uh, when we band, uh, we collect data from all the birds that we put bands on. We send that to the banding lab. And uh, they then are responsible for managing all of the returns. So all those returns that you saw 
uh, on the map that uh, Chris and Nova showed were birds that were recovered at other banding stations, or some of them may have been birds that might have been picked up by individuals, let's say an owl hit a car or something like that. Um, those uh, numbers were submitted to the banding lab. The banding lab then sends a report to the bander, the original bander of the bird telling them where that bird was originally, uh, uh, where that bird was recovered. And uh, then the person who found the bird uh, gets a, uh, a message from the banding lab, which tells them where that bird was originally banded. And uh, so that's, uh, that's pretty much what, what their role in this whole thing is. And so to, um, to get a permit requires um, working with a, a bander, becoming proficient at uh, whatever the trapping technique is that's being used for that particular species. And um, uh, that apprenticeship usually involves you know, several years. And then once you get to a point of proficiency, you apply for the banding permit. You have uh, people that can vet your experience, write letters of recommendation. And then uh, if you have some kind of a project, uh, then uh, hopefully you'll get a permit and then you can become uh, go banding on your own. Um, a lot of people are happy to just be assistants. And so they don't get a banding permit. They just work under banders. Um, so at Whitefish Point, for example, we have a master permit, uh, what's called a station permit, which is overseen by Rich Keith, who uh, works at the Kalamazoo Nature Center. Or actually, that's now Chris is the yeah, Chris is now Chris, the master bander. Chris, is, yeah. Chris is now the master bander, yeah, for that permit. So Whitefish Point has its own station permit, and that oversees any banding operation that operations that happen at Whitefish Point. So if we hire, uh, for example, the, the fall owl banders that come in, um, because Chris and Nova just banned in the spring, um, those fall, those owl banders don't have to have a permit. They are subsumed under the, the station permit that Whitefish Point has. In the past, when we've done passerine banding, which we did for many years in the fall, uh, same thing. The banders that would, we would hire to do that were, uh, they may have had their own permit, but it wasn't necessary. They just, uh, they were working under our permit. And so, um, but, but all of that requires uh, that you have a, a federal permit so that you are allowed to, to handle these birds. And that's just for the birds protection and to make sure that people, whatever people are doing with the birds is legitimate and has, has a good reason and isn't just for, you know, because I want to go out and catch some birds and look at them. <laughs> Which I mean, we all would love to do, but. <laughs> we would all love to do. So if, if you if you want to do that, then you come visit one of us banders and you can look at all the birds you want to. We'll just do the catching part. Right. Um, so I have, I see a couple of questions. And so I do want to make a clarification in terms of um, visiting the point. So. The point itself is open to visitors, just our, our owl banding is not open to the public because the banding lab is not very large in space. Um, but the point itself is open, it's an open area. Um, so the trails are open during daylight hours. You're welcome to, to visit at any point in time um, as long as as long as it's light out. Um, the hawk deck and the water bird shack, there is a hawk counter and a water bird counter also on staff right now. Um, those things are open. You're welcome to go visit them. Um, of course, following safe protocols, but um, it is an open area and it is outdoors. So it's it's still open to everyone. You're welcome to visit. Um, and the parking area, as far as I know, is still open. I believe there may be some construction happening with that later this year, but um, but I'm not I exactly sure. I don't think that's started yet. I think, yeah. yeah. So just wanted to clarify, you are welcome to, to visit. It's just the owl banding that is not open to the public because the banding lab is very small. So there's not a lot of space. Um, so someone is asking about the cause, what's causing the decline in the banding of boreal owl, owls, or maybe just the whole yeah. population. <laughs> yeah, the, you know, this whole Northern uh, forest owls, the hawk owl, Northern hawk owl, great gray and boreal. That's a really good question. And like uh, Nova was saying, we really aren't sure. Uh, and unfortunately, all three of these species, the bulk of their range is well north of the breeding bird survey. So we don't have uh, this a long term data set on their populations that we can look at to see if those populations are really declining or if it is some kind of a climate uh, effect and they just aren't coming down as far south because the winters aren't as extreme and uh, they, they don't need to. 
um, these birds, uh, all three of those species tend to follow some sort of an eruptive cycle that tends to follow uh, the, their prey base, which are often voles uh, and, and other uh, rodents, mi either microtine rodents like voles, but some, some uh, deer mice and so on. Um, and um, those animals tend to follow uh, cycles of mass production by uh, various uh, boreal forest trees. And so, um, you know, it may be with, with climate and with warming that those, those population changes aren't as dramatic. Um, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to say, but like, for example, this year, you know, we had a big uh, winter finch year, uh, which we haven't had in quite a while. And those, they are also following these uh, mass production uh, cycles of, of the conifers. Uh, which also tends to influence a lot of these rodent populations. So why we didn't have an influx of um, uh, some of these uh, northern owls this winter, it's, it, you know, hopefully it's not a range-wide population decline, but uh, it's, you know, I think it's going to take a little bit more, uh, I, I suspect it's going to take some concerted uh, population monitoring to try to figure out what's going on. But uh, yeah, it's a good question. It's, it, it, it really doesn't make sense because those fluctuations were pretty much like clockwork. Uh, and then all of a sudden they just kind of petered out in the last eight or so years. So, yeah. Um, so someone was asking, they're, they're planning a visit for early July. Um, I do want to mention Summer banding, summer owl banding does span. It begins July 1st and goes until, oh man, August 25th, I believe. Yeah, I think yeah so. August 25th. Um, they were asking about being able to like photograph owls. So do you have suggestions for how to look for owls when visiting the point? Yeah, so um, probably the best thing, well, so in the summer, the, the challenge is going to be um, the, the diversity, the owl diversity is going to be way down. Uh, the, the target species in the summer is, are the northern sawwets because, and this is still being examined, uh, for whatever reason, the point, uh, and Chris and Nova sort of discovered this, the point is sort of a staging area for juvenile sawwets. What, what they've found is that uh, when these birds are off the nest by the end of June, early July, they start to amass in the in the uh, the point area. We we don't know how extensive that is because we don't have, you know, other uh, surveying going on in in areas nearby, like say down at Vermilion Point or over Taquamanan. But in any event, the 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 concentrations are quite high around the point, uh, and so they they follow the same uh, banding protocol that they use in the fall and the spring, using the the lures and so on, uh, the audio lures. Um, but they're, they're the only owl that's there. So all these other species that we would see during migration, you know, you're not going to see the long-eared, you're not going to see, you know, uh, any of these other species at that time, other than ones that might be normally nesting there and, and they would be few and far between. Um, so in terms of finding the sawwets, the, the best way is really just kind of working your way through the jack pines and paying close attention to the the uh, where the branches come out of the trunk of those trees just looking at those spots because that's that's where they tend to roost They'll t they tend to sit on a branch right up against the trunk and um, it just takes uh, some elbow grease and spend some time uh, and usually you'll get rewarded uh, now it's always you know uh, good to you know ask around if anybody's been up there and seen something because that can save you a lot of time. But you know, that just depends on when you're there, if there's other people that have been out. Um, but certainly eBird is a, is a good resource to check if anybody's been up there recently and seen some, they may be able to identify a particular area. But, um, but you're able to walk into, well, actually, I'm not sure how access is in the summertime with the wildlife refuge. Um, I was just going to about ready to say you could walk into where the, the banding area is, but I don't know if you can in the summertime. So I think that 
it is closed during that point because they're actively banding too. And so that time of yeah. year, the trails are closed. Yeah, but you can, you, can, you can still get around it and there's still a fair amount of jack pine that, that extends beyond the, the boundaries of the, um, uh, the Sini Wildlife Refuge. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's just worth checking out, uh, checking out the jack pines and, and uh, scanning the, the trunks. Um, the other thing would be to uh, talk to the um, uh, field ornithologist and uh, they might be able to point out places where they've seen them when you're up there. Um, so you mentioned Tazarin banding. And so someone's asking if that's still done at WPBO. We don't do that anymore. I don't know how long that lasted. Yeah, there was many years. Uh, and I'm trying to remember what year that was that ended because uh, it was it was a while ago. Um, but uh, they have a we had about a 10 year data set for banding both at Whitefish Point and then we had a second station down the coast uh, toward Marquette at Vermilion Point. Um, and uh, Vermilion Point actually banded both in the spring and the fall. Uh, Whitefish Point was only in the fall because in the springtime the raptor migration is so concentrated there that the mortality from sharp shins, particularly going after birds in the net, what made it too dangerous to band. In the fall, the raptor migration is very diffuse through Whitefish Point, so it's not that much of a, of a problem, although you still can get them come through occasionally. But, um, but at, at Vermilion Point, it wasn't uh, that concentration of raptors wasn't uh, as significant. And so, yeah, so we had uh, qu quite a long data set there, but um, it would be wonder wonderful if we could find the funding and, and start that again. Uh, but um, yeah, we haven't done that for, for several years, but, but it's still a, you know, the point is a phenomenal migrant trap for not just owls. I mean, it's, it's great for everything. So it's worth going up there this time of year uh, because, you know, you can have some really incredible warbler days when, uh, and not just warblers, I mean, all sorts of boreal species moving through. So well worth it. And the surrounding environment as well. I mean, over at Taquamanon, there's, there's good birding down at uh, Holbert Bog. There's a bunch of good birds that you can pick up in that area. Um, so someone is asking about the feet because Chris and Noah showed the feet of several of those owl species. And they said it looks almost furry. And so they're wondering if they're covered in just feathers, if there's actual fur on them. Yeah, so, so birds uh, don't have fur, but they have, uh, you know, feathers and feathers uh, are serving the same purpose as fur in mammals. It's an insulator. Um, obviously, it's become, uh, feathers have become highly modified in the wing and tail for birds for flight, but primarily uh, feathers are the body covering because of Birds are warm blooded just like we are. And so to retain that heat, they have this insulating cover. And of course we're familiar with that because we use down and in, in jackets and sleeping bags and things like that because it's a really good uh, insulator. But um, so many of those feathers that are uh, responsible for being an insulator, uh, the barbs on that come off of the shaft of the feather, rather than being uh, knit together the way they are on the veins of a, of a primary or secondary or tail feather, which is designed to be a flight service and to be relatively flat, a lot of the, the feathers that are designed to provide heat uh, and a downy feather is like this, those barbs do not connect. They're just long and filamentous and they, they act just like hair. So they have a very hair-like appearance. But if you were actually to look at that, that individual feather, it would still have a shaft in the middle of it. And then off of that would come these, these filamentous barbs that are acting as the, the insulator. And so on the feet uh, and on the legs, particularly a lot of birds that are found in, um, in cold environments. So, uh, you know, a lot of the, the owls that they were showing, but also, uh, you know, we have several hawks, rough-legged hawk has a very, have feathers that go all the way down to the feet and they're, they're serving the same purpose. So they're both protecting the leg from snow and ice and so on, but underneath that, they've got a lot of these very downy feathers that uh, uh, provide the insulation. So they, they, they do look very hairy, but they are, they are a feather and they do have a shaft, uh, like, just like a pinion on a, on a wing or a tail. Um, so another question about seeing birds at the point, when's the best time? Early in the morning is what they're assuming, but... Yeah, so like, you know, pretty much like anywhere, uh, dawn to 10 or so is going to be your, 
your peak time. Uh, during migration, you've got a little bit more leeway because birds are active relatively continuously th throughout the day in, in migration because they're foraging uh, in preparation for their flight, particularly songbirds, which largely fly at night, spend most of their day foraging. They have a siesta time that starts around 11 or 12 and goes to about two or three, but then they'll have an activity that'll uh, level or point where it'll pick up again in the late afternoon to evening. And then, you know, they usually take off about 30 to 45 minutes after sunset. Um, so during migration, your activity level is a little bit more continuous. In the summertime, man, it's like somebody rolls up the sidewalks at, at you know, 11 o'clock and, and everybody takes a siesta until, you know, later in the afternoon. Uh, but, uh, but morning is certainly going to be your, your highest activity time. And, um, and the point's no different, you know, uh, so um, you want to get out as close to dawn as you can. And it just gives you more hours birding too, so. Right, yeah. So um, I, do, I do see a couple questions about um, watching owls at dusk from the hawk platform. Um, so that is during migration, only during migration. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, but any advice or thoughts on that, Mike? Um, yes, yeah, so, and actually I will say this, I, you know, um, I've been up there at, at, at times in both in the, the very late fall, so after migration and uh, even in the summertime, the hawk platform is actually a great spot just to, to view the jack pines. And so you, you can occasionally get, uh, get some resident owls that, uh, that will come out. Um, it's not a guarantee, but um, during migration, yeah, the, the thing you wanna get up there, I, I recommend getting up there about 30 minutes before sunset. And then just you know, kind of stay there and just you just scan the the treetops, and then as the um, uh, as the sun sets, um, you're gonna you you'll see these birds. They'll they'll often come up and they'll perch on the tops of the jack pines, and you'll see them. And then once one hops up, if if there's a large group of them, which they often are, particularly the the long eards. But um, uh, the, I've been up there. Matter of fact. The picture they had in 2005 was a year I had one of my classes up there. We were there that day when they took that picture. So we saw those, all those great grays they got. And they got uh, their, you know, they had flights of great grays that were not 20 or 30 birds like they have with long ears, but still, you know, quite a few, four or five of them would take off. And so, um, yeah, so you just, you just stay up there and kind of just scan the, the treetops and then once, once you see one come up, you kind of get a searching image and, and the, the rest of them pop out for you. Great. Um, so we are, we are running um, into our hour um, of time together. Um, so if you still have questions, you're welcome to add those to the comments on the Facebook page and we can answer those um, later or email us at birds at michiganaudubon.org. Um, I do want to just quickly mention, because this is another question, in terms of public viewing when it is open to the public. Um, it's very much just being able to view that process that NOVA was describing through banding. Um, they're really good about showing what they can while they're still doing their work. Chris and NOVA have been doing this a long time, so they're really great at being able to explain what's happening while they're doing it. So it's a really great treat, and I would suggest when possible that you do check that out because it's definitely worth your time. Yeah, um, for sure. But I would also like to thank you all for joining us. Thank you to Mike for helping answer these questions. Thank you to everyone who came to help um, learn some more about the Owls of Whitefish Point. And if you're interested in supporting the owl program at Whitefish Point Bird Observatory, please consider adopting an owl. Um, there are several species available for this symbolic adoption. And included with the owl adoption is a five by seven color photograph of the selected species that you pick a certificate with your name on it and a profile of that species that you symbolically adopted. They make a great gift and they provide you with the satisfaction of knowing that you are helping um, WPBO continue to, to do this very important research for owls. So if you're interested in, in this symbolic adoption, you can find more um, information about it at WP, WPBO.org. Um, so on the website under the support tab, but um, just something to consider and something to check out if you're interested in helping to support the OWL program. Um, there are other ways to support WPBO as well, so you can find out more about that on our website too. Um, so thank you again for joining us today. Next week, 
next Thursday, seven o'clock, same time, same channel, same place. Um, we'll be back for our second webinar in the series. Um, and we'll be joined by Rich Kaus, who is the current hawk counter at WPBO. And he's going to teach us more about hawk and raptor identification. So it should be a great time. Cool. Um, I hope to see you guys there. And thank you again for a great evening. Thanks.